I'm Dr. James Thomas. Let me tell you how I do a laryngoscopy exam so that you know what to expect if you need one. Laryngoscopy is the um, art of looking at the larynx or the vocal cords. And we have two ways to get there. We have cameras that go through the mouth or cameras that go through the nose. And today we're going to view the exam through the nose. Here's my buddy Bill. Bill's going to help walk us through a laryngoscopy. He's a half head. There you go. Anyways, what we're going to do with the flexible laryngoscopy is we're going to go through the anesthetized nose. And when the camera gets back to what's called the nasopharynx, the pharynx being this vertical tube here, it's going to turn 90 degrees and look downhill. So nasal cavity, nasopharynx, that's where your adenoids were before your doc took them out. This is the oral cavity, so we call this segment the oropharynx, and the bottom we call the hypo, or below, the hypopharynx. There'll be some anatomy in there we want to pay attention to, but in the end, we're, of course, going for the vocal cords, and they are down here, Bill's Adam's apple. They are connected just below that, so on me, just below this line here, that's where my vocal cords are. Now, while the meat of the problem is the vocal cords, let me go through the setup to get you there. I always put on a recording headset because the voice, the larynx, we want to hear what's going on as well as see. To make the exam comfortable, I use topical lidocaine plus a decongestant. What does that do? It opens up the nose so, and anesthetizes it so that this camera can go through the nose without sneezing, coughing, or discomfort. I spray the nose with the lidocaine and then, surprisingly enough, I start the exam in the mouth. Well, why do that? There are three nerves that come out of the brain, three cranial nerves, 10, 11, and 12. And 10 runs the vocal cords, but 11 and 12 come through the exact same opening. So I want to look at those nerves on my way in. And if I get focused on the vocal cords, I may forget about this stuff and forget part of the exam. So I go ahead and take a look in the mouth. And what I'm looking for specifically is how the palate moves, because that's run by cranial nerve 10. And I have the patient say, ah, and I watch for symmetric elevation of the palate. Then I take a look at the tongue, which is cranial nerve 12, and I examine it for any fasciculations and its movement left and right. Now that that's done, we get to the really good part of the exam. That is, we're going to go in the nose and look at some boogers. At least that's what everybody thinks. Well, I warm up the endoscope in hot water so it doesn't fog up. I lubricate the endoscope with a little bit of lidocaine jelly so it slides easier. And all this leads to a comfortable exam. Now, interestingly, we all have hair at the front of our nose, and that's the only place where the green stuff is. Once we're past that, we'll see the septum, that is the piece of cartilage that divides the left side of the nose from the right. And we'll see things called turbinates, these big pink structures. And we're sliding between them. When we get to the back, I pause and take a look again at function. What do I expect to see? In the very back of the throat, in the middle of the adenoids, oftentimes I see a scar. We'll see what's called the torus tuberis, and that's the opening for the eustachian tube. So when you yawn and stretch your palate, that pulls this opening open and lets air go up to the ear or lets air come out of the ear so you can equalize the pressure. So if it's symmetric and complete, the soft palate will come up and touch the back wall near the adenoids, and there won't be any air escape when you say pa pa pa. So it's a bit of a neurologic exam that relates to the vocal cords. We don't want to get too excited and go to the vocal cords because whenever you go to what you th where you think the problem is, your brain ignores a lot of good things around it. So I'm going to ask you to ignore the vocal cords and the voice box in the center of the picture. And I take a look at the pharynx. That is the muscle surrounding it. The pharynx is at the back of the mouth called the oropharynx and the place between the tube between the back of the mouth and the vocal cords is called the hypopharynx. Well, structure-wise, you can look at it. There's some lymphoid tissue, which is the pebbly appearance to the wall. But we're looking for what's called pharyngeal squeeze. And I have the person say, Ew! And when they do that, we should see the two muscles on either side squeeze symmetrically. And that, again, tells us about the function of the cranial nerves. We will see the epiglottis. And the epiglottis is a floppy piece of cartilage like your ear, and when you swallow, it flips over and it just passively flips back up. Next, 
we zoom in a little bit closer and we get a view of a closer view of the voice box. And in this view, the V-shaped structure are the vocal cords. On the outside, they're attached just below the bump of the Adam's apple. So this spot corresponds with the point of the V. And because we're looking from above, the front of the voice box is at the bottom of the picture, the back is at the top, and it's inverted on the screen. The right shoulder is going to be on the left side of the picture. That makes this white line the right vocal cord and this one the left vocal cord. These are called the true vocal cords. That's where we get sound from. These are called the false vocal cords, and we can speak with them if we squeeze everything tight. They will vibrate at a very low pitch, but we don't usually use it. There are two bumps here on either side. These are called the arytenoids. They are not vocal nodules, but I swear every singer asks me if they are. We zoom in on the vocal cords, and I tend to watch them for a little bit while someone breathes because there should be some movement with breathing. It should be symmetric. We can compare one side to the other. And then I will have the person make a sound. And with that sound, we'll end up watching the vocal cords come together. That process is called abduction or opening and adduction or closing. And we bring them together to cough, <coughs> to speak, and when we swallow, to close off. So basically, the vocal cords are a valve. If we look carefully, we can often see below the vocal cords down several rings of the windpipe towards the lungs. If we put the camera in and not just look at the vocal cords from above, but we slide down very close to them, we can then angle the camera to look along the vocal cords. And what that view gives us is it lets us see into what's called the ventricle. And that's like a cave between the true and the false cords. And at the front of it, there is a, a little gland called the saccule. And we can look at that as well. So by getting close, we get some detail. And we can see underneath the cords, that is the subglottis. And we can see the muscle of the vocal cord called the thyroid. We can see it in the vocal cord, but we can also see its thickness below the vocal cord. So those are the structures that I look at. If we're going to do a really, truly detailed laryngeal exam or laryngoscopy, and we have the equipment, we might turn on what's called a strobe light and perform a stroboscopy. The videotape is recording at 30 frames a second. And when I'm talking to you here, my vocal cords are vibrating 100 times a second, so the video can't possibly record it, and all you see is blurring. But if we take a strobe light, turn it on, match my pitch, set it off from the pitch just slightly, just like the helicopter blades we see spinning in the sky, they look like they're moving, we can see apparent motion of the vocal cords. We will look for symmetry and suppleness of the vibratory wave. We will look to see how well the person completely closes them, how much time they spend close, and some other details of the vocal cords. That's what a complete laryngoscopy should involve. It should be comfortable. Now, if you're a gagger, in addition to the spray in the nose, one might spray medication down the throat. I would guess about one out of 10 of my patients need some extra anesthetic in the throat in order to be completely comfortable with the exam, but it should never hurt. It should be an easy exam, and your laryngologist should come away with detailed information about your vocal cords, their nerves, how they function, and whether or not the structures are all intact. I'm Dr. James Thomas. For more information, please check out voicedoctor.net.